Thank you, Andre, and, and thanks to Glenn as well for hosting my, my visit here today. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to come and talk to you about uh, this topic. I, I have to warn you, however, that in a sense I'm masquerading as an expert, when in fact I'm not really an expert at free electron lasers, in so much as we don't run a free electron laser here in the UK, and uh, we only, when we're very lucky, get time and access to any of the international free electron lasers. But as Andre pointed out, I was involved in the uh, in the UK NLS project for a number of years and therefore I guess did look quite carefully at the science case and the science that can be done with free electron lasers. So essentially I'm going to talk about three things. Uh, the first two are more on the nature of a general review and the third is more about some recent detailed work. All to do with ultrafast science with X-ray free electron lasers. So I'm going to begin just by reviewing what X-ray laser capabilities there are, what, what is special about an X-ray fell. Um, then I'm going to give a, a, a survey of the new science which X-ray free electron lasers can enable. And this is to a large extent informed by the analysis we did for the NLS project and also by subsequent uh, research that has been published from the, uh, from the active projects. And then finally I'm going to talk about ultrafast science with the LCLS free electron laser, the Stanford free electron laser, which we've been involved in in my group um, and which we uh, would like to, to share at least some of the preliminary result, results from some of that uh, work. And, and what we're particularly interested in in my group is very fast measurement. So uh, back at Imperial, our lab is interested in measuring attosecond timescale processes. And the question we are curious about is what can free electron lasers do in this very, very fast time resolution? And I think it's quite exciting to say that, in fact, I think there are real possibilities for free electron lasers to contribute, if not to at a second time scale measurement, at least a few femtosecond time scale measurements. And that's what I will uh, touch on. Well, one of the things to keep in mind is uh, when one's discussing big facilities like free electron lasers is, um, is <laughs> okay, good. Um, I thought, echo here. <laughs> okay, so uh, one of the things that one needs to think about when planning big facilities is, well, what's the strategic science objective of this facility? And so when we were developing NLS, we thought about, well, what are the scientific or some of the scientific frontiers for the 21st century? And we came up with three, and there are many others I'm sure you could come up with, given a spare afternoon. You'd probably come up with some better ones than these. But essentially, one of the ones that I think is very exciting and potentially very important is to make nanometer scale imaging of arbitrary objects in their native state. So in other words, to be able to measure things in the real time at which they're functioning with, the, uh, with an extremely high spatial resolution. So we can actually watch microscopic, nanoscopic objects moving around. This is clearly going to have a big impact in nanoscience and nanotechnology, but particularly in life sciences where we know we would like to be able to capture a living cell at nanometer resolution doing its business in, in, in the real world. And that at the moment is challenging. We cannot necessarily, we, we have techniques that can image, that very advanced optical imaging techniques and other techniques that allow us to see certain aspects of what these, these C cells that might do or what subcellular um, uh, uh, objects can do within the cells, but not to capture the whole story. And so it would be great to have tools that allow us to do that. We'd also like to be able to measure the mechanisms that underlie physics, chemistry, and biochemistry at the atomic scale. In other words, to make what are generally speaking called in a sort of slightly sloppy way, molecular movies. So making molecular movies to watch, say, a chemical reaction happening, not just a, a chemical reaction involving a small molecule, but perhaps a chemical reaction involving a biomolecule, actually happen in real time, to actually see how the atoms move around and how different bits of the, the molecule interact with the, with, with the solvent or whatever. And then finally, the other area which we think is exciting is the possibility to control electronic processes in matter, to direct things at the natural time scale of electronic motion in matter, which is in the few femtoseconds or even sub femtosecond or at a second time scale. So those are some of the challenges, some of the frontiers for science in the 21st century, some of the things we'd like to be able to do in order to push our science forward. So just to sort of summarize that idea in a sort of a graphic, here are different 
things that can happen in nature that we would like to study. And here are their characteristic spatial and temporal scales. So the spatial scales here are, are ranging from angstroms to, to, uh, to, to tens of angstroms and from um, picoseconds down to attoseconds. And what we've kind of aware of is that if we want to look at dynamics in condensed mat phase matter or chemical dynamics, we need to have temporal resolutions on the sub-picosecond to few femtosecond time scale and spatial resolutions down to an angstrom or better. Um, if we want to make sudden images using coherent diffraction imaging, say, um, of, of, of these live cells, um, we need because of the radiation damage pro problems, we need very short pulses, which constrains us to few femtoseconds or few tens of femtosecond pulses in order to capture those images. And then finally, if we want to look at electronic motion, then we need to go to a faster time scale still. We need to go to the few femtosecond or sub femtosecond time scale. So that means that to do this science, to use all the, all the advantages, for instance, of, of x-rays that allow us to do light scattering, to allow us to do x-ray spectroscopy, we want to have a source of x-rays that are ultra-fast, high brightness, with a high repetition rate, because we want to measure things in the real world, and that usually requires us to measure many, many um, examples of the same process in order to get good statistics. And obviously, they have to be in the x-ray range, because there are a whole bunch of techniques, including diffraction and crystallographic-based techniques, um, the ideas of coherent diffraction imaging, where you basically reconstruct a scattered image, uh, to, to reconstruct from a scattered image the, the, the structure, and also all of the different x-ray spectroscopy ideas that give you local structure and allow you, in principle, to study uh, details of chemical and, uh, and physical processes. So I want to then start by talking about X-ray laser capabilities, or specifically free electron X-ray laser capabilities, what those machines give us, and why that matches to some large extent what we, what we felt we needed for that uh, um, that, uh, uh, that, that science. So really the, the plot here is the sort of plot that I think people have looked at in regard to light sources for many years, where you plot the photon energy against peak brightness. And this peak brightness scale is, is highly logarithmic, so this is about 10 orders of magnitude from here to there. Um, and essentially, the brightest undulator sections on bright uh, conventional synchrotron systems gives us a peak brightness of about 10 to the minus 20, sorry, 10 to the 24 in these units. Um, and LCLS can give us um, something like 10 to the 33 in these units. In other words, a 10 to the 9 increase in, in brightness. Enormous increase in peak brightness. It means that in a pulse, instead of having just a few tens of photons, we now have something like 10 to the 12 photons. The pulse is also are much shorter than in conventional synchrotron X-ray light sources. So typically, those systems have pulses on the tens to 100 picosecond duration. You can apply some sort of fancy pulse slicing techniques, but at the cost of photons, heavy cost of photons. So the output of LCLS and other X-ray free electron lasers is about four orders of magnitude shorter. So pulse durations down, as we'll discuss, to a few femtoseconds. And finally, the output of an X-ray laser, you would expect to be coherent. Well, it's partially coherent, at least. Its coherence properties are at least significantly better than what will come out of a, a normal undulator. So you can think about using the coherence properties, too. So any one of these in itself is already a game changer for X-ray ultrafast science. All of them put together is, is really quite revolutionary, and that's why uh, one's wanted to pursue it. So and specifically, what you can get from free electron lasers is high temporal resolution. Sub-20 femtosecond resolution is, is not beyond what can be done already at LCLS. Um, the pulses are partially coherent, so you can think of using various coherent uh, imaging uh, strategies. Um, 
your photon energies, of course, can be quite high, and that opens up many different kinds of me methods of X-ray spectroscopy for structural um, determination and, and chemical information, so X-ray absorption spectroscopy, inelastic X-ray scattering, X-ray diffraction. All of these um, possibilities are available if you have um, uh, your bright source of X-rays. And that high peak brightness, um, which uh, is... Is, is available for angstrom wavelength x-rays. So this potentially allows us to do these single shot x-ray imaging, x-ray diffraction imaging measurement. Okay, so I don't think I need to tell you about SASE, but I will just give, show you this cartoon from a very nice article, I think in Nature Physics, a, 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 a news and views or a review article by, uh, um, uh, I think by Brian McNeil from, 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 from Glasgow, where he discusses um, how SASE works, and, and, and this is a nice illustration. So what do you need? So SASE, self-amplified spontaneous emission, is the operating principle for all current and planned hard X-ray um, uh, um, uh, free electron lasers. So the input is a low emittance relativistic electron bunch. So the, the, the low emittance is extremely important. You will not get this X-ray lasing proper process if you don't have a very low emittance electron beam. Um, the energies, of course, are relativistic. So typically, uh, we're talking about electron energies from a GeV up to about 15 GeV for the operating free electron lasers around the world. And that bunch comes into an undulator in Going through the undulator, it interacts with the magnetic fields, the oscillating magnetic fields. It emits photons. The action or the interaction between the emission of photons, the, the oscillating uh, uh, magnetic field that the bunch sees, leads to a kind of self-organization, spatial self-organization within the electron bunch, which gives this partial coherence, partial um, uh, uh, temporal coherence to the output, and that's, that's really the core of the way how it works as an X-ray laser. So the field comes out as bursts of coherent light um, uh, over a short duration, each over the sort of cooperation length of, uh, within the bunch. Now, th that means that we have this partially coherent, high brightness, short pulse of hard X-rays that comes out. Because this Process SASE, as it says, is self-amplified spontaneous emission. Those of you who are involved in optics and quantum optics will see immediately that means there's some stochasticity to the process. In other words, this is quite noisy. It means that every pulse of light or every pulse of x-rays is not the same as the one before. And indeed, this can be seen as rather different to a conventional laser in that regard, but it still has some remarkable properties. And towards the end, I'll talk about how we can cope with this non perfect nature of the beam and still make ultra-fast measurements. Okay, so here's a schematic of the uh, LINAC coherent light source at SLAC in Stanford. Um, basically, what's happened is there's a three-kilometer um, electron LINAC available at Stanford, the one that was used for all the famous particle physics work in the 70s and, and 80s. Um, the last kilometer of that has been turned over to use for light sources. So the uh, up, up, uh, upstream two kilometers, as I was hearing at lunch, is used still for doing some interesting accelerator science uh, things. But the last kilometer is used to accelerate an electron beam up to about 14 GeV. Um, that then is passed through a, 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 a series of undulators. There's about 30 undulators. At, at the, the total length of the undulator section is about 130 meters. And it's in there that SASE occurs, and we get pulses of X-rays generated. Actually, that's the SASE section. That's the, the undulator section there. Sorry, there. And then there are two experimental halls downstream of that. This photograph predates when they were actually built, but they're located here and here. So basically the electron beam goes um, under, uh, 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 goes, goes through a tunnel after the end of the LINAC for about 200 meters, 300 meters, then through the undulator section, and then the X-rays propagate on down here a further few hundred meters to get to the, what's called the FAR experiment hall, which is actually des designated for hard X-ray experiments, where the softer X-ray experiments have to be done in the near hall. So the idea of these sorts of free electron lasers was first, first proposed by Pellegrini in, in 92, and a lot, num, number of other people uh, started to, 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 to look at the concept and, 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 and push forward the technology. 
So here are some operating parameters for LCLS as of 2012. So LCLS started as a user facility in 2009, so about, uh, uh, I think first lasing was in May 2009, if I recall correctly, or was it 2008? I'm beginning to forget, but anyway, it was four or five years ago, and it was almost straight away being used as a user facility, so we were involved in user experiments back in the autumn of 2009. Um, and so here are the operating parameters. So it can operate either in the hard or soft X-ray range, but to summarize, that means that now it operates between about 10 keV down to about 500 eV, and recently it's been extended down to about 280 eV. Now, that's significant because that's coming down to below the carbon K edge, so you can now access the carbon K edge also with this machine. Um, the uh, photons per pulse in the hard X-ray range is about 210 to the 12 photons per pulse in soft X-ray range, about an order of magnitude higher, just because the photons have less energy. But we're talking about a millijoule of X-rays coming at your experiment. So it's really, really a lot of X-rays, particularly considering the pulses are typically, if you use a high bunch charge mode, the higher bunch charge mode, are typically on the order of about 50 uh, femtoseconds long. So the peak, um, peak brightness after a focusing optic, uh, uh, a Kirkpatrick bias focusing optic, where they can focus down to a couple of micron spot, we're talking about intensities of about 10 to the 18 watts per centimeter squared or higher. So for those of us in strong field physics, that's an impressive intensity. You don't see conventional strong field effects in the X-ray range, but nevertheless, it's a very, very high power density that you're interacting with. And that opens up all sorts of new possibilities, in, in particular the generation of double core holes and, and other such things, which are interesting uh, potentially in, in chemical uh, analysis. So here are some parameters that at the time, in 2012, were under development, and some of these are now actually available uh, to users. Um, so we have hard X-ray self-seeding is now available. The hardware was installed and it was tested. Um, there's simultaneous delivery of X-rays to, to the hard X-ray hutches, production of longer wavelength X-rays, as we just mentioned, now to the carbon K edge. Terahertz radiation is being tested. I believe that's now or soon to be a user facility, so you can have a, a pump probe experiment where you have terahertz followed by X-rays or whatever. Um, what we'll talk about a little bit is the two-color double pulse operation and the double pulse operation using slotted foils. And there's various other modes that are currently under development. So there are a number of hard X-ray projects around the world, including, um, of course, LCLS, uh, the uh, DESI XFEL project. It was called Tesla years ago. It's an old slide. Um, uh, but now it's the Euro XFEL, which is going to start shortly. There's already an operating free electron laser in Japan and an other number of of, of, of late free electron lasers in development in Korea, China, Switzerland, and elsewhere. So the two operating free electron lasers are our friend LCLS and SAKLA at Spring 8 in Japan. SAKLA is a more compact machine, purpose-built. They didn't use, reuse an old 40-year-old LINAC. They're actually using a brand new LINAC, which they built, and they worked very hard on engineering it, so everything's compact. It's only, uh, it's less than a half a kilometer long LINAC, so it's really much more compact, and it still operates in hard X-rays. And that is now operational, so um, as we said, LCLS has been operating for users since 2009. SACLA has been available since May last year. One of my students was involved in one of the first beam times there. And then we have the European XFEL in Hamburg, uh, which is scheduled to start operating, I believe, around 2015. And what's going to be remarkable about that is it's a superconducting LINAC, so it can run at a higher repetition rate. It can generate something like 10,000 shots per second. Now, since almost all the science you can envisage to do with these machines is very data-hungry, you need lots of data to get good statistics, to get meaningful information, the high repetition rate is an extremely important feature. And this is why this potentially could become the most important X-ray laser in the world quite quickly. Okay, a survey of new science with X-ray free electron lasers. I'm going to keep this rather brief because I think some of it you may have heard before. One of the early 
poster child experiments for the free electron laser was single molecule imaging. So using diffractive in imaging to image a single non-crystallized protein molecule and thereby to get through this, this, this roadblock in crystallography which requires you to have a crystal in order to get a structure and many proteins do not crystallize. So the concept here is you come in to your object, uh, your isolated nano object, it may be a protein, it may be a, 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 a single cell organism or something, and then that scatters in the x-rays and you record the whole scattering pattern in a single shot. And then you computationally reconstruct the image using these fancy phase retrieval algorithms that have now reached an extremely high level of sophistication. So this, uh, thanks to a number of, 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 of theoretical works back in the 60s and 70s, has now become a reality um, uh, in, in the lab. And so the dream is to have instantaneous capture of the shape, the atomic structure, the magnetic structure, the electronic properties of nanoscale objects and, of course, an example of nanoscale objects, biological systems. And the concept really is this, um, particularly for biological objects, uh, the, the structure is very quickly destroyed by radiation damage. The, radiation, the, the problem with x-rays is for every elastically scattered x-ray, there are many inelastic processes, so you kill your object very quickly. So it takes, however, a finite amount of time, some tens of femtoseconds, before that death registers in the structural arrangement of the object. So as long as you can make your diffraction pattern before the thing blows apart in some sort of Coulomb explosion, you can um, get your information of what the structure looked like. Of course, it's dead after, but that's not our problem, right? Um, and this method has been colorfully called diffract and destroy. And in fact, it works. And here's some evidence that it works. Three recent papers from LCLS demonstrating it works. So the concept had already been demonstrated that flash synchrotron, the soft X-ray, sorry, it's flash uh, free electron laser, the soft X-ray free electron laser in DESI. But really, when you go to the harder X-rays, you start to get much better um, information, much better spatial structural information. So one of the first studies was on the mini virus, which is a very large virus. And this is the diffraction pattern from a single virus particle, and it was enough scattered light to reconstruct the shape of the virus. At the same time, the first protein nanocrystallography was performed there. So they just basically take a nanocrystal. It's much easier to grow small crystals than big crystals. So they basically are using this machine to do nanocrystallography. It's, it's a field that's opening up also in conventional synchrotrons, but nevertheless, it's ideally seated to these free electron lasers. And then last, so these were reported in Nature, I think, uh, two years ago. And then last autumn, um, uh, in Science, was published the first un previously undetermined structure, and this is of a protein which is the active agent in the sleeping sickness virus, or sorry, sleeping sickness bacteria, um, and, and that uh, was, I think, already an important dis demonstration of how important these, these light sources p are set to be. And some of the uh, ideas as to what you could do in life sciences using these things beyond protein uh, structure determination. Um, these are ideas actually from, from, from um, our wonderful colleague uh, uh, Louise Johnson, who sadly died last year. But I mean, Louise had a real vision about this and I think really helped us with the NLS project. And some of her vision included the possibility to image intact condensed chromosomes and to look at the functioning of nuclear pore complexes as, as, as two unsolved problems or problems which would lead to deeper in, uh, 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 measurements that would lead to deeper insight in life sciences. So there, there are many things still to do in this regard, but nevertheless, I think already um, these, these machines are showing their worth. The other thing you can do is because uh, these pulses are very short and in, in principle you can do some sort of pump probe measurements, uh, one can look at ultra um, fast uh, processes using other m imaging methodologies like time resolved holography and, and ultra fast x ray photon correlation spectroscopy to pick up rapidly fluctuating and changing systems or measure rapidly fluctuating and changing systems. So, one possibility is multiple exposures, which can work if the thing is sufficiently hard that it can survive the radiation damage of the first pulse. So, now we can envisage two pulses. 
they're looking at some sort of correlation structure in, in that. And so this possibility to measure fluctuating systems is another thing that's opened up by free electron lasers. And here's some, some brief examples. So the idea of imaging complex quasar particles, including Cooper Pears, has been put forward by a number of workers, including your own Andrea Cavalieri, who's very keen on this idea. And also recently, the possibility to measure what I would see as a fast, rapid, fluctuating, rapidly changing system, and that's a, a warm, dense matter object, a, 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 a non debye plasma, as we used to call them, um, where uh, you can create a near solid density plasma and then and, 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 and with an X-ray free electron laser and study its spectroscopic properties. And this is work due to Justin Walk and his group working at LCLS. And this is looking at the edge shifts uh, due to the uh, uh, threshold ionization potential depression caused by the high density of the system. And this is, I think, an illustration of what can be done across many different fields of physics with applications all the way from high TC superconductors all the way over to fusion energy. Um, in terms of measuring structural changes underlying physical and chemical processes, one has the possibility to use um, free electron lasers as part of a kind of pump probe uh, measurement sequence where you might come in with another wavelength of light as the pump. So, for instance, you might want to excite a vibrational mode in, in a molecule or a lattice vibration or some electronic excitation in a molecule. And you can do that using UV or terahertz short pulses and then probe using X-rays, either soft or hard, and then study the dynamics by varying the pump probe delay. So the whole concept of pump probe uh, transferred into the X-ray region. So again, here's a cartoon to illustrate the concept. An initial pulse excites the object, maybe a lattice vibration, and then the X-ray pulse, either looking at X-ray scattering or X-ray spectroscopy, can probe the whoops, can probe the um, the changes in either the atomic uh, uh, the atomic uh, geometry or the electronic excitation or the spin states uh, using using the information from the scattered X-rays. Now. X-ray, one of the components of such a measurement is the ability to use X-ray spectroscopy, and that means as well as having short wavelength requirements in order to do high resolution scattering measurements, that we just discussed, you could also need to have short wavelengths to reach the edges of the various elements that may make up the, um, uh, the, the sample in order to use um, X-ray spectroscopy in particular concepts like XAFs, where you're relying upon the interference between it within the, of the uh, photoelectron wave packet between direct and scattered contributions to the total cross-section, and from that you can work out nearest neighbor distances and other such things accurately. Um, so that means that you need an X-ray laser that can get to the edges of the different elements in the periodic table. So um, here is illustrated in light yellow the edges that are accessible with 100 EV to 1 keV photons, in, 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 in orange, uh, the ones that are accessible from 1 to 2 keV, and in green, the ones that are accessible by something up between 2 and 7.5 keV. So you see, to get most of the, if you want to get the majority of the edges, um, both K and L and M edges, you need to have a, a wavelength span from your machine that is at least from about 100 EV up to maybe towards 10 keV. So it's again a case for hard X-rays, or at least quite uh, quite hard soft X-rays, in order to access these uh, these uh, the, the, these edges. And if you can do that, then there's possibilities to study all sorts of processes like catalysis, like what's going on in photosynthetic systems and artificial photosynthetic systems in real time, and get genuine information about what's actually happening in those systems, which is to a large extent having to be inferred from measurements at the moment through a lot of models whose correctness we don't entirely know. And so there's recently been some of the first experiments on X-ray spectroscopy at LCLS, a femtosecond X-ray absorption spectroscopy um, uh, on, on a spin crossover system, a kind of a, 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 a model for some of these, uh, these, these systems whereby there's a, a, a metallic uh, atom embedded in a ligand and, and, and one can understand and measure uh, some of the time-dependent properties of that. And that, that's, that was recently published from work at LCLS. 
Okay, I'm going to stop there talking about the general science overview. Just that gives you a flavor of the various things that could be done. And it's not comprehensive. There's a great deal being published all the time from, from LCLS and from uh, Flash and the other free electron lasers. And so this has not in any sense claimed to be a complete overview. And you really need to go and, and explore their websites and look at the, uh, the latest results coming out in order to get a, a clearer picture. But what I do want to talk about is doing what I would call ultra-fast science with, 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 with free electron lasers. And by ultra-fast science, I mean not just measuring things at the hundreds of femtosecond timescale, but actually getting down towards the ultimate timescales of chemistry, which are a few femtoseconds. In other words, being able to resolve all the motions of all the atoms in, in a molecule undergoing a chemical change. You would need a time scale on the order of a few femtoseconds. If you wanted to measure how the electrons are moving, you would need to go down below a femtosecond of time resolution. So how do free electron lasers behave when they're trying to do that? Well, I'm gonna, this is a rather busy slide, and I should have unpicked it a bit before presenting it. But one of the great things about LCLS is they keep having great ideas as to how to run the, the system a little bit differently to change its parameters. And one of the early, really smart ideas was to say, hey, we could run with our usual nanocoulomb or quarter of a nanocoulomb uh, bunch charge, or we could go down to a really low bunch charge, and how does that change things? Well, I think I mentioned before, if you have a, 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 a relatively long bunch, then you're going to get many X-ray spikes emitted during the bunch. Each of them will be coherent internally, but they will be mutually not coherent. If you go down to a very low bunch charge, however, you get a single spike, or something close to a single spike. And so with low bunch charge, 20 picocoulomb operation, they have evidence of, of pulses only of about two or three femtoseconds duration. So these are really suitable for X-ray ultra-fast measurements. Um, what's interesting is the peak power of the system doesn't go down uh, because it, the energy of the pulse goes down. There are fewer spikes, but the peak power of each spike can be as high, if not higher, when you've only got one. So running in this um, low bunch charge, this 20 picocoulomb operation, was discovered as a viable mode of operation in 2009. There's a nice paper by Ding and the, the t Paul Emmer's team who did, developed this. Um, and that we used in our first collaborative experiment where we worked with the team led by uh, uh, Phil Buxbaum's group in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in Stanford where they were trying to do some time resolve measurements using these uh, these short pulse X-ray lasers. And the time resolve measurement we tried to do, or did succeeded in doing, was to measure um, something you couldn't measure without a time resolved capability. So let me tell you about the experiment. It's a pump probe experiment. The pump laser is an 800 nanometer high power short pulse laser. And what that does is interact with a sample, in this case of nitrogen molecules, and causes uh, the formation of a rotational wave packet. So it, in, it impulsively creates a rotational wave packet, and, and that has the property that it has periodic revivals of alignment. So every so often, you come back to a state where the molecules are predominantly aligned in one direction or another with respect to the laser polarization direction. And that lasts for about 100 femtoseconds or so, and then it dephases again. And so if you interact with, the, um, with that rotational wave packet at the right moment when it's well aligned, you can actually look at the angular properties of things like photo uh, electron uh, emission or Auger electron emission from the sample. And that's the experiment we did. So what we did is to measure a process that's only opened up by the high intensities from an X-ray free electron laser like LCLS, and that's double core hole formation. So imagine you have the, um, the, 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 the K shell of, a, of, 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 of an atom, in this case nitrogen. It normally has two electrons, so there's one S state, right? And normally you can have a single core hole form when you have an X-ray absorption, and so you've just got one, uh, one hole in the core. And that then is quickly filled in the, the light uh, elements, mostly by Auger processes. It's quickly filled in a matter of a few few femtoseconds, tens of femtoseconds, and, and, and then it's gone. However, if you have a very bright source, in the time while it's gone, another X-ray photon can come along and take the second electron out, and then you have a double core hole. And in fact, it turns out you can either have your double core hole both at the same atom, or if it's a molecule, you can have one at one atom and one at another happens at the atom, and that's called a two-site double core hole. And as we'll see in a second, that has some real um, 
potential chemical significance. So if we measured for the first time the Auger angular distribution of double core holes in nitrogen using this possibility of aligning our molecules. So because we needed to have good timing, because we needed to have the rotational wave packet at the peak of the alignment, it required us to, to think of it as a time-resolved experiment. So in fact, it was, I think, the first time-resolved experiment, LCLS. But the time, um, the jitter time constraints between the laser and the, uh, the LCLS pulse were not especially demanding, uh, because the rotational wave packet lasts for hundreds of femtoseconds. So as we'll see in a moment, that's as, just as well. So that was published a couple of years ago and was an illustration of how you can use this, this free electron laser to do time-resolved measurements and also how you can use it to do uh, specifically these angularly resolved Auger measurements. So there's been a whole batch, a whole bunch of AMO physics experiments where people have looked at, 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 at multiple ionization in strong X-ray fields. Uh, the first of those was, uh, well, actually, I haven't got... Uh, li Linda Young's experiment, which was the first one looking at neon, where there was a complete stripping out of many electrons from the neon atom. Uh, but there have been many others where they, people have even observed two-site double core holes. And the reason that everyone's interested in two-site double core holes is because they should give you real chemical sensitivity. When there's two, two uh, core holes, um, their, um, their, interaction sh their, their interaction is, of course, very sensitive to the distance between them. And you've got a large chemical shift then associated with changes in R, uh, to the, the internuclear distance, that so you can register in your in your, in your X-ray spectroscopy and get, therefore, structural information from that kind of X-ray spectroscopy. It was first predicted by Len Sederbaum uh, about 20 years ago. Okay, so that's one uh, dream. The other dream is to do pump probe experiments using these, uh, these, these free electron lasers. So here's another one, which we were also involved in, uh, where, again, we're using a laser beam, a laser pulse as the pump, and an X-ray laser as the probe. In this case, the laser beam is interacting with cyclohexadiene, which is a ring molecule. And if you tune in with a, with a UV laser, you can excite it into a potential energy surface that can cause the ring to open. And also in the process, it transverse, traverses a number of conical intersections, and so there's some rich chemical dynamics going on. So it's an interesting system. It's a model for um, uh, photochemistry in many, many respects. And then the idea is to probe the structural state of the system using X-rays. So the idea in this experiment is to use the X-rays to kind of, kind of do a Coulomb explosion fragmentation and uh, pick up signatures of the stru time-dependent structural change. Now, the experiment worked in principle. We could see as a function of time how the X-ray fragmentation pattern of the molecule changed. But there were two complications. One to do with the detailed physics of the interaction of the X-rays. There's lots of Auger decays that go on, intermediate step decays, which uh, mean the X-ray fragmentation pattern is somewhat complex to interpret. But more fundamentally, we have a problem in that the jitter between the laser and the free electron laser pulse is about two or three hundred femtoseconds. Now, this process, although the full ring opening is over in a couple of hundred femtoseconds, there's subsidiary longer timescale processes that take about a picosecond, so we can see those well enough in this measurement, but you can't see the fastest timescale processes because of that jitter. So the question is how to get around the jitter problem. Now, the origin of the jitter is, is pretty technical, but it's to do with the fact that your, your electron uh, bunch and the photons that are emitted from it aren't, aren't, aren't exactly the same thing. So there's, there's some stochastic um, uh, element in the Sasse process, which means you've got different spikes and, and lasing at different moments within the bunch. But also, there's this uncertainty about the arrival time of the electron bunch into the undulator. Uh, it's all clocked by this RF field, and even though the Precision of the timing of that electron bunch with respect to the RF field is something like one part in a thousand of the RF cycle. That still corresponds to quite a large jitter time. And so it's an intrinsic, inherent jitter. Remember, this machine is a kilometer long, so this is quite challenging to get it down shorter than that. So approaches to do better are underway. So this is to remind you of part of the problem. So SASE um, leads to both wavelength, and temp wavelength fluctuation and temporal jitter. So this is a, a calculation, but the real output of free electron lasers does not look very different to this. This was calculated actually for the modeling of the NLS machine, but it illustrates the point. 
So here we have, um, in time, what the output of a SASE emitting free electron laser looks like. And you see many, many bunches, many, many spikes. This was a relatively high bunch charge, so you can actually uh, restrict it to a single spike. But if you do, then that spike will be jittering around in, in emission time within this envelope. So we've got a sort of, in this case, about a 60 femtosecond uncertainty in when the, or, or pulse duration. Similarly, in the photon energy space, you have a similar jitter. You have a similar spread. So sort of stochastically filling in around a band. So what are the consequences of that? Well, we have a temporal jitter of sort of plus or minus 100 femtoseconds, and that inhibits all sorts of things. It inhibits, as we just said, synchronization with external sources. So if you've got an external laser source, it means you can't have this synchronization locked to better than about 100 femtoseconds. You know, you can fight it down, and there's a lot of work going on on synchronization. I think, I think that, in, in, I believe, I don't know this for sure, but I believe that in, in Flash, they got it down to about 40 femtoseconds or better. But nevertheless, it's still always kind of there. Um, it means, therefore, you can't really do high temporal resolution measurements. And also, because of the spiky structure of this guy, it really inhibits what you can do when you're interested in nonlinear interactions, where you would really like to have a well-defined transform-limited pulse so you could understand how the pulse intensity then affects the process you're looking at without the complication of multiple spikes, which are different from every shot to the next. As far as the wavelengths, uh, fluctuation is concerned, well, it inhibits X-ray spectroscopy. X-ray spectroscopy normally requires you to have a well-defined wavelength. Um, it inhibits measurements on inelastic scattering. Again, you've got to have a well-defined wavelength coming in. And also, this chemically sensitive, the possibility of chemically sensitive coherent diffraction Im imaging is also compromised because your wavelength isn't fixed. You know, there is, it's possible to put a monochromator uh, upstream of your sample, so you can select the band that's passed, but then your fluctuation in wavelength is then transferred to a fluctuation in intensity and the cutting out of a lot of the photons that you might otherwise have used. So there are some issues. So one way around the problem, I guess an elegant solution, but actually not a simple one to implement, is to say, okay, what did we do in the old laser days when we had these, 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 uh, these noisy sources? Well, we, we used them to pump another better laser. So that's the idea here. You use the SASE free electron laser to pump an inner shell um, uh, inversion in, in a neon atom, and then you get a nice narrow laser, X-ray laser radiation in the atom at, in this case, 850 EV. And this was demonstrated last year by Nina Roeringer's group using the LCLS system. So in a way, that's a way to do it. Here they have a very well-defined, I think there's an order of magnitude improvement in the spectral purity. It's locked to the atomic resonance, so it's not fluctuating around in time. But it has some of these advantages. It's fixed in wavelength, and it's hard to do, are amongst those. But nevertheless, it opens up possibilities of using these fixed frequency uh, emissions for, uh, X -ray, uh, um, for, for, for inelastic scattering experiments and other, other such things. A better, more robust solution is to injection seed. So again, this is a, a lesson from the old laser days. Injection seed your free electron laser, either at the wavelength it's operating or at some subharmonic of that wavelength and use various cascade processes to get the control on the, on the soft X-rays. And this has been implemented in the Fermi uh, free electron laser uh, in Trieste. And this is very successfully operating so that now they have a very well-defined um, X, this is X -ray, laser wavelength, X ray laser wavelength. It doesn't jitter at all. It's absolutely locked. It's intensity stable from shot to shot. Really beautiful X ray laser emission. The only problem is this is at a carrier uh, frequency of about, um, about, I think, about 30 nanometers or something. It's not hard X ray. These are v, this is VUV. And so it's not actually a viable approach for real hard X-ray lasers, as elegant as it is, and it will prove useful. It will prove useful for people interested in, in, in valence shell and in a valence spectroscopy. This will be a, a great source. But nevertheless, it doesn't allow us to do that with a hard X-ray source. We don't know how to do seeding with a hard X-ray source. So here's a beautiful idea implemented by Jerry Hastings and his group at LCLS which comes a long way towards solving the problem. So what they do is they have, uh, they have a long undulator section. Remember, it's 130 meters of undulator. So it turns out you get saturation of SASE in the first, less than the first half of it. So you, you, you've got lots of 
undulators to play with. So the first 15 undulators they have uh, setting up doing the regular sassay. They then have a section of un one undulator taken out and a diamond spectrometer placed in there and a, a, a chicane for the electron bunch. So basically they bypass a bit of the electron bunch through into the second undulator section and injection seed that with light that's been spectrally filtered by the diamond um, spectrometer and that then injection seeds the second section of undulator. And what they get is a spectrum that looked like that, the red spectrum before they did it, to one that looks be beautifully spectrally pure after. So this uh, self-seeding eliminates wavelength jitter and this is a mode I understand they're now offering to users um, and so it promises to fix the wavelength jitter but not the temporal jitter. This doesn't address the temporal jitter at all. So within, if we look in the time domain, this spike will still be zoom, zooming around within the possible uncertainty of, 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 of X-ray lasing. So uh, it, it's very important for X-ray spectroscopy type measurements, but it's not actually going to help very much for the ultrafast measurements as it is. However, another approach which has gained some traction is to say, OK, well, let's, let's not try and stop the jitter. Let's just try and measure on every shot what the relative timing of the x-rays and the lasers are. And if we can measure that accurately enough, we can then resort our data, and we can still do a pump probe experiment. It's just that we have to reconstruct it post-fact from, from, from the data analysis. And a beautiful and elegant scheme from the laser group at LCLS, I think Ryan Coffey is one of the main authors on this, is the following where they have a time stamping idea which works really well. So what it comprises is a silicon nitride sample that reflects uh, optical light. The reflectivity of the silicon nitride is temporarily spoiled by the arrival of x-rays. And it's a very fast electronic process, so it's switched off in femtoseconds. So what they have is an optical pulse, which is synchronized to the X-ray laser, uh, which has a chirped continuum spectrum. So it has a, a, has a broad spectrum. It's been chirped, so there's an encoding between spectrum and time. And just by measuring in a spectrometer in the detector plane where the jump in reflectivity occurs in, this, occurs in the spectrum, they can sort the timing of the pulse, relative timing of the pulses. And they think they can do this with a sub-20 femtosecond resolution. So this is really nice. It means you can resort your data and get your sub-20 femtosecond resolution. So uh, the job's sort of done, but not quite. So it's combined with self-seeding. This might just do. But you do still need a very high rep rate to overcome the fluctuations. Because remember, you're still going to have intensity fluctuations. You're going to want to have to normalize those out. You're probably going to have to bin on pulse energy, on photon energy, on timing jitter. So by the time you've unbinned all, you've binned up all your data, you haven't got very many shots per bin, so you need to have lots of shots to get meaningful data, and so you need high rep rate, or someone to generously give you an awful lot of free electron laser time for your experiment. So here's another solution, and that's to eliminate the temporal jitter by doing X-ray pump, X-ray probe experiments. And those are now being developed. There's one concept which is well established to do a split and delay. So you basically do a wave front split on the, on, on the x-rays and then you recombine them. And that can be done and split and delay is being used. Um, but it's got some intrinsic problems. It's pretty hard to do, actually. Um, and one, another approach is to use the generation from the free electron laser of two pulses, either at a single frequency or at two different colors. And this they can now do. So I'll tell you about this scheme and then I'll tell you about the other scheme. So one scheme, uh, which we've used, and I'll tell you about some of the results in a moment, is to come in with your electron bunch um, in the first half of your LINAC, and you've still got another section of LINAC to go. You come into a chicane, which sort of kicks and, 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 and messes around with electron bump, bunch time energy distribution. And then in this part of the chicane, where the um, electron energies are somewhat dispersed, you introduce a slotted foil. So this is a foil with a slot in it. You can either have a single wide slot or two narrow slots. Whenever the electron traverses this thin foil, its emittance is spoiled. So in the subsequent undulator, it will not laze. But if you've cut out a little section of that, of that foil, so the electron bunch doesn't actually interact with any material there, its emittance stays good, and it will laze. 
So just by sliding the slotted foil in and out of here, you can change the physical distance between the two slots that laced, which corresponds to changing the time delay between the two bunches. So you get two, bu two electron bunches going in of unspoiled emittance and coming out with two X-ray pulses. In principle, it sounds great. In practice, there's certain fluctuations and other things you have to take out. But in principle, and I think in practice, you can make two pulses of about three femtoseconds uh, each duration uh, separated between zero and maybe 20 or 30 or 40 femtoseconds. And they're absolutely locked together, so you've got sub-femtosecond jitter in this case. The other idea, which has just become available, and this was pioneered last year, and we did an experiment with it in March, so we were involved in one of the first experiments using this, uh, this, this uh, scheme, is to actually have an X-ray, a, a two-pulse, two-color scheme. So here you use a single-slotted foil up, upstream, so you've got a single electron bunch, but again you use your magnetic chicane, and you, 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 you kick part of the electron bunch, so the bit that's already laced no longer interacts uh, with, the, uh, with the second section of undulator, uh, but the other part of the electron pulse comes through and then interacts with the second part of the undulator. You tune the two undulators slightly differently, so you slightly tune their, their magnetic parameter K so that you've got one frequency in the first pulse and another frequency in the second. You change the delay using the chicane. And basically, again, that allows you to make two pulses, now of slightly different color, um, separated by up to 20 or 30 or 40 femtoseconds, I don't know what the, what the limits are, and they're each of sub-3 femtosecond duration. So the photon energy difference in the pulses amounts to a few percent, and beyond that, it won't laze. But at 500 EV, we were able to change uh, plus or minus around 10 EV the photon energy. So if you're looking at evidence of resonances in, the, in, a, in, a, in a molecular system, that's enough to actually pick up different resonances. OK, so let me tell you about an experiment, the analysis of which is not yet complete, but which I think illustrates the potential power of these techniques. So this was using, in fact, we used both techniques, but I'll tell you mostly about the, uh, the, the one that was, was, was the measurement that was made first, because that's the one we've had most time to analyze. So here are the two slotted foils actually drawn. There's actually a number of different configurations, and I'll go through them here. There's one where there's a single wide slot. This is called fat in the notation we use, because it's a nice fat slot, and that allows us to get lots of photons. Then there's uh, one, I think it's not illustrated here, where we use just the last apex. Of, I know, it might be this one. This is thin, because it actually lays it so... We, the, the, you, 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 you move the um, interaction point so far up the slot that only one part of the electron beam lases, so you get a single thin pulse. And then you have others where you get two pulses. That's, that, that corresponds to a 9 femtosecond delay, that a 13 femtosecond delay, and that a 17 femtosecond delay. And we use these five delays to study a simple X-ray fragmentation process, in this case, in oxygen molecules. So what we did is we tuned our, our, um, our free electron laser to about 531 EV, which is near the pi star resonance in the oxygen molecule, which starts some sort of dissociation dynamic. And then we look at the fragmentation pattern as a function of delay between these different configurations, thin, fat, 9 femtoseconds, 13 femtoseconds, 17 femtoseconds. And what we see is at certain delay times, the angular distribution of the double ions and the triple ions changes character, changes symmetry from a sort of a, a vertical to a horizontal peanut, indicating we're exciting transiently a different resonance. Now, um, I'm not going to tell you all of the gory details of this analysis, which is still ongoing, but nevertheless, we're seeing a transient change in these angular distributions. It's not so clear in the way this data is projected, but basically, 9 femtoseconds is quite anomalous to compare to thin and the later time. So there seems to be something going on on a, on a few 10, uh, t t you know, around the 10 femtosecond time scale. So, in fact, we've done more careful measurements, or not more careful measurements, more careful analysis. And what that reveals is for the different delays, we get slightly different interaction spectra. So, I think the green, no, sorry, blue is a single color, it's a single pulse, so this is the so-called thin configuration. We sh that, that shows up the uh, pi star resonance at 531 EV, and a second resonance at about 535 EV. 
Um, and that second resonance we've called X, because we didn't, don't really know what X is. But the position of X changes. As we go to the 9 femtosecond delay, it moves in towards the pi star and actually eventually merges with the pi star and a second resonance, new resonance appears and then that also moves up to uh, in the green data which is the longest 17 femtosecond delay. So this is a way of looking at a very fast X-ray spectral changes of what's going on in the molecule. So what we think is actually happening is we have our pump which excites the pi star resonance. There's then a very rapid Auger decay, which populates excited states of the O2 neutral. They start to undergo dissociation. These are, these are non-binding potential energy surfaces. And then we pick up transient resonances in the second pump step to these uh, excited states in the O2 plus system. And this is essentially what we think we're tracking. Um, this, by the way, I wouldn't want to be broadcast or, or, or retained. This is a very preliminary interpretation of our data. But it nevertheless, I think, illustrates the fact that we now have a tool to allow us to measure sub-10 femtosecond dynamics uh, X -ray, uh, initiated by X-ray lasers. So I think that's sort of kind of exciting. And at that point, I'm going to stop and just tell you about the future scene. So this is where the world will probably be by 2020. There will be X-ray free electron lasers in the USA, at least one, possibly another being built. Germany will have two, that's Flash and XFEL. Japan will have at least one, possibly a second at the University of Tokyo. Switzerland will have one. Korea will have one, possibly more. Uh, China will have at least one, and there will be others either built or under construction. And I would argue that to compete, to actually be part of this new scientific development that allows us to do ultra-fast uh, structural determination, in, 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 we would UK would need access to a light source with similar capabilities. It would need to have, as we said, uh, an energy range from about 100 EV to 10 keV, ideally, a repetition rate of at least 100 hertz, and preferably much, much higher than 100 hertz. Pulse durations down to or below 10 femtoseconds with uh, lots of photons, a millijoule pole per pole. So my question to you is, any ideas about how to build one? And I think the main ingredient is probably pound notes or, or whatever. But uh, um, So anyway, those of us involved in X-ray laser science in the UK have formed the UK Free Electron Laser Forum. Justin Walker, myself, and Malcolm McMahon from Edinburgh are organizing a meeting in London at Imperial on June 14th, to which you're all very much invited. It's free, so you'll come and get a free coffee and a free lunch. Um, uh, it's, so it's going to be in the Blackett Laboratory, the physics department at Imperial, and we'll have opening remarks by Sir Peter Knight, then a review of imaging um, capabilities from two of the world leaders, Janos Haidu and Henry Chapman. Um, uh, Jim Naismith will talk about UK life sciences possibilities, Ian Robinson from UCL about uh, nano, uh, imaging nano uh, particles, uh, Steve Johnson from ETH in Switzerland about uh, looking at uh, condensed phase dynamics, um, John Costello from Ireland talking about um, AMO physics with these uh, systems, uh, myself talking about ultra-fast dynamics, Robin Santra about some of the interaction physics, Malcolm McMahon about accessing extreme states of matter, uh, Thomas Cowan about a new beamline being planned for XFEL for doing high energy density matter, and Justin Walk about his solid density plasmas. And finally, we're, we're having a closing remarks from John Wormersley, who may or may not have some good news for us by then. So anyway, thank you for your attention. <laughs>